here, Sunset Sound Studio One. Welcome, Eve Rothman from Ali and AJ to Cherry Glazer, Nasty Cherry, Ivan and Alyosha, and my favorite, Eve Toomer. Welcome, Eve. Thank you, man. Thank you. It's an honor to be here. Oh with you. no, this is this is great. This is like Mr. our Joe our family. This is the, we're we're, uh, we're we're we should also add my next door neighbor. We're neighbors at Sunset Sound. Yeah, your noisy neighbor. <laughs> so I'm equally <laughs> noisy. <laughs> when I start cranking my mixes, I know it's got to be like just bumping. I there. just get, I just turn the PMC up louder. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, you were you were doing some bass the other day, and it was, it was just like, loud. wow, my low end on this mix is pretty potent. <laughs> this is impressive. <laughs> but You're right on, man. Uh, we're here with Eve, and we got to talk about a couple of projects of yours that I love, that For I'm sure. just a super fan of. Um, we we both have had the good fortune to work with Clem Creedy on Cherry Glazer yeah, records. Yeah. Uh, I did uh, Apocalyptic, which was uh, maybe about five years ago, something like that, and it was just a pleasure. Uh, Carlos De La Garza and I did it together. We did it here at Sunset Sound Studio One. Oh, you did it in this. Yeah, one? I was tracked, wondering. We tracked right. here, um, and you, I know, are, are about to start a new album with Clem. But you did that great Metallica cover that I heard. Uh, I don't know, maybe about a year or so ago. Yeah. And I, and I thought it was really, really great. The thing I loved about it was. Not only the drum sound, but I loved how the guitar, and it, maybe it was cut up, or maybe it wasn't, but it just had that feeling of really being chopped up and processed and just stutter-like in, yeah, in a great we, way. We wanted, I wanted to do like a total flip on the song, and so we kind of did like an industrial hyper-pop take on it. And we, yeah, it was a lot of like chopping it up, and I resampled it and played the guitar by hand. On the keyboard. Oh, that's great! Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's great. Now, that's that's what I thought made it sound really, really. Yeah. Fresh. So I played it, and then I chopped it up, and then loaded it into battery, and then just replayed it. Fantastic! By hand. And, oh. it has and that. Clem did the solo. Uh, Clem played the solo. Yeah. Great. Yeah. And then the whole end of that just kind of goes in a nice place that yeah, I really, really yeah. love. That was a fun. That was a cool project. I'm glad that Metallica decided to do that yeah that absolutely cool. there's a lot of other really great artists on that but clem was down with the whole process of recording like this and chopping up samples yeah yeah, yeah. she up. wanted she wanted to do like just a totally different version that's great and she knew that i was like adventurous adventurous enough to like go down the path with her but it was a really quick session i think we i think we did the whole thing in like two days amazing it was right before christmas and we just yeah it's like the last session of the year we just knocked it out because she she knows exactly what she wants yeah she, like she hears she hears something she's like that's it you know and she's just like very that's it and that's done and like that's it's cool working with her because it's it's really quick and inspiring and she's like really confident and her Absolutely. choice is almost yeah. more confident than me sometimes. <laughs> yeah. And and I love that now um, she's found a place in her voice where it's chill and warm yeah. and really evocative. Yeah. Uh, when we were working together, it was much more band-like right. and it was really stronger. There were definitely those moments that were uh, more chill and kind of whispery and those were always kind of in some ways my favorite. Right. But... Um, I think now she's really, really found her tone, and it's yeah. it's always really great, like seeing an artist develop over time. Like you know, um, in, in the case of maybe Young the Giant, who right. I worked with on their debut album, and to see them four albums later and what they've become is amazing. And to see Clem yeah, it's have really that cool. same and the growth. fact that she's still so young. Yeah, I mean, she's only I think she just turned twenty five. <sighs> amazing. So yeah. she's just like, she's like in her prime and she's, this new record that I'm making with her songs are super strong. I was like, I was really taken aback by the, just the straight up songwriting. I was just like, wow, this feels like a level up, really confident in like who she is now. And the songwriting just felt cohesive across the album, even though there's like songs that are very different sonically. Uh -huh. Like the underlying tone is like super cohesive. And is it more electronic or is it more band like? Uh, it's. There's electronic elements, but yeah. we're trying. My whole thing with her was up because she made really cool demos and she went around and kind of did the songwriting thing and wrote with a bunch of different people. And so 
we kind of gathered, it must have been like 20 or 30 songs, and we've narrowed it down to 12 or 14. But so what I, what I wanted to do was I put a band together, and we kind of just jammed. It was like the first time the song would be jammed, like, uh -huh. other than the demo. And then through the jamming, kind of come up with it, get it going, and then add electronics on top of it. Oh, wow. but I also like I also like to when I'm doing stuff like that, I always like to keep it where there's at least two people playing it every time. So Me like, too. I'll cut the bass like the basic tracking, guitar, bass, and drums, and then if the guitar player is going to do another overdub, I'll have the drummer do some percussion, or I'll have the bass player do some percussion with the. I always like to keep it at least two people going until it's like okay now we have to do actual single overdubs but i felt like i feel like when you do that Chemistry. i don't know it just kind of keeps it Absolutely. as cheesy as it sounds it just kind of just keeps no, the, the energy going agree. there's nothing i mean every project i do i love to get as many people yeah. in the room at the same yeah. time because there's a chemistry there's a magic a connection that happens and even if you don't keep any of those yeah, other yeah. overdubs there's some spontaneity yeah, that happens I, between the sometimes players. i even you know i'll even go back and we'll redo the drums or we'll redo the bass we'll redo stuff but it always it it always starting from that like real place i feel yeah and then also like my like neurotic OCD kind of <laughs> goes into overload and I can't catch every mistake so that's probably a good thing where when I do it like when I do everything as an overdub I'm like you know literally like in there like a madman tweaking every little bit so but when it's like a lot of people it's like I can't take it all in so just let it let it be a little bit more of a mirage. Wow, that's pretty funny. No, yeah. I, I, I'm okay with that. I, I don't mind. Maybe I'm just because I grew up making right. records with bands yeah. and was in bands, yeah. and you know, kind of, I'm all right with being in the room with five people and just kind of having everything come at me. Right. I always find like sometimes my my sounds might be compromised yeah. because I'm so focused on a guitar part that I right. forget the hi-hat sound or right. whatever but don't uh, you but don't you sometimes go like you solo it and it sounds weird but in the in the mix you're just like well I don't know like the I, bass is over the like the bass is peaking but you can't it just sounds like the pick attack is good I, I never you know but when I do it when I do it one by one it's like oh god you know i'll sit there for an hour right because it's know, up loud in the, the bass track. until it's just like the pull text just perfect you know what i mean and yeah. where when there's a band you're just like no just that's true that's true it, you know? uh, i th i think one of the biggest mistakes people make when they get started is just that everything right. in isolation yeah. soloing yeah. stuff and trying to get something to sound good in in solo no one has a solo button at oh, home yeah. when you listen to yeah, things yeah, yeah. even if you're listening in atmos you don't have a solo button so it's it's a painting it's how all the yeah. pieces work together so for for me it's truly about um how the big picture is yeah. and i hardly ever solo anything yeah. but that's so funny i was talking buzz, about that last night with uh, finishing a record for ali and aj and we were in the studio and we were finishing a song and they're like solo the vocal solo this solo this. and i kept saying i was like no i don't want to solo anymore let's just listen and because i was opening i was like eqing some stuff i was like let's just eq it yeah. and turn stuff up and down based on what you're hearing because like the moment you solo something like oh the vibrato at the end of the word is like a little too wobbly i'm like but in the track you can't hear like why it's not Exactly. But I had I I still have to learn that because it's, like, it's still like a thing for me where I'm just like get in there and I just start. <laughs> no, I, <laughs> like I have to pull back. I, I remember years ago um, working with Jimmy Iovine, uh -huh. and Jimmy was working with Bob Clearmont on a record at the same time. Right. And Jimmy came back and said, you know, the interesting thing about the way you make records is when I listen to your overall blend it sounds great when i listen to bob's blend it sounds really good but when i listen to bob's individual tracks and solo they're perfect but sometimes they don't always fit together 
but he said, when I listen to your stuff in solo, sometimes it sounds questionable to me, right. but when you hear it all together, and I, I, I mean, I, I just, I don't know any other way to work. Yeah, it just yeah. happens I mean, to I, be the way I, I guess, work. I mean, it's kind of gone around town, but like all the, like the Queen isolated tracks and like Marvin Gaye, when you pull that stuff up and you... Marvin Gaye, when you pull that stuff, it's pretty funky. It's I mean, wild. In a lot of ways. <laughs> yeah, and then like there was a Queen song and like the bass, you could hear all the tape edits and you could hear just like weirdness all over the place but then when you unmute it you're just like oh it, it sounds, sounds great epic absolutely you know it's yeah, funny absolutely but not yet yeah, yeah you can't but, can't work with your eyes <laughs> just with your ears good good you quote I mean? really the moment you start really staring important. at pro tools you've started the new cherry glazer record yeah, already yeah yeah you've cut tracks yeah so we've done basic tracking uh -huh. to to the songs bass drums and then like the main guitar and now, starting next week, we'll dive into more guitars and keyboards and do the vocals. But um, while um, we're, yeah, go ahead. No, I'm uh, sorry. So, and is Clem? What's Clem playing these days? So Clem, Clem's playing a lot of guitar, and then she's really into her um, Poly Six. Ah, nice. Yeah. So she brought that over, and she's just tons of Poly Six stuff. And we're trying to push. The electronic envelope a bit but in a, like a raw way kind of like how bands like elastica or curve or nine inch nails in the 90s would have done it where it felt to me as a listener it felt organic so like we've been miking up i've been taking drum machines and like sending them out to guitar amps mic'd up love doing that and so we did like we did one song where i had the drummer i had triggers on the drum drums and so i was taking like um we used an old uh, D4. It was like a song that kind of had like a, a it's the Roland D4. Yeah, the Roland oh, D4. Oh, yeah. D4. I got you. Yes. That's the, that's the drum brain that like Jesus and Mary Chain would use. And so we, there was a song that kind of felt that vibe. And I didn't want to program the drums, so I just put, I had kick and snare trigger and an SPD in the live room with the drummer, and he was playing. And so instantly we were kind of hearing that like big 80s reverb snare and like the clicky kick. But then he was doing fills, and so it, and it wasn't on the clip on the grid, so it just felt like, you know, organic. It had life to it. That's great. So I keep I always try to do stuff like that, and so, yeah. And then keyboards, all the keyboards were running out to amps. We went over to Guitar Center. And yeah, definitely those took a those bunch of amps. sounds benefit from being put through a guitar. Yeah, amp. yeah. So and sometimes even a small. Oh yeah, guitar. little. Yeah, I my favorite. I mean, still it's like a. The, old 90s the radio trick. shack the, no the um the cigarette the oh yeah. yeah i still i have a couple of those the cigarette the amp time. and then the the little pig yep pig nose yeah pig nose and there's a, a radio shack amp that was made in the 80s it's a little tan box you still see uh, them no, no, no. for 10 bucks or something oh, wow. very similar to the the cigarette kind of sound yeah. a little fuller sounding uh but they're really work great yeah. for a lot of things yeah I, i'm a big i mean all the keyboards I do, we're always going through guitar pedals. I'm taking a direct, I take three signals. I do the direct signal dry, a pedaled signal that's direct, and then the amp through the pedals. Great. And so we have all three. And I like to make real big pedal chains, and then we'll just do keyboards like that, and then we'll plug the guitar in through that chain. But everything is like getting, because then what's really cool, I love like all the amp simulators as well. So like, I'll, after I've like thought it's done, you know, I'm like, oh man, it sounds awesome. And then it's like, oh, the DI. And then I'll take the DI and start clicking through. Um, there's this one plugin I like at the moment is this guitar amp simulator called uh, Archetype. Have oh, you heard no, of that? I don't know it's that. Really cool. And then there's is that one Native Instruments or no? I think the I don't know what the name of the brand is, but the it's a head. It looks like a yeah. like a cat like a amp head. It's called Archetype and the guitar player Tim Henson, he's like a prog guy from yeah, the eighties. Yeah. He did a model, his version of this plugin. And it's literally the, one of the only plugins where like you click through the presets and you're just, you kind of don't touch anything. Wow. <laughs> you're kind of like, wow, that's amazing. So I, I like to do that once Archetype. I'm like, yeah, when I'm starting to run out of sonic ideas, I just like start sending all the DIs through amp simulators. That's great. And then doing auxes with what, the other thing I've been into lately that um, this mixer that I just worked with turned me on to was taking like reverb sends, mm -hmm. taking a reverb send and then running it through. So you do the reverb and then the um, 
the Michael Brower uh, binaural uh, plugin on um, you mean the, waves. the motion yeah, the motion that, I love that plugin so that through but that after reverbs like yes. reverb sounds right so, so, the, re so the reverbs yes so I've been doing like I've gotten into a lot of that with like delays and reverbs through the Brower motion great and that just kind of like starts to add a weird yeah, so exactly. I, I love doing stuff in the box but yep. I go I start doing that stuff after I've exhausted like yeah. I mean you know a lot of the 80s thing I would always take drum machines if we had a PA system yeah. in the studio. We'd mic the room That's awesome. and um, you know put the kick and snare yeah. or tom fills through the PA system. Usually, like Fender twin amps oh, were great because cool. you could break them up a little bit on the front end. Yeah, yeah, those yeah. were really cool. But yeah, to me, yeah, all those like kind of uh, uh, Jesus and Mary chain cult, all all that kind of mid late eighties uh, goth sort of stuff yeah. was all like blown that up kind drum of machines. I, yeah. I love yeah, that too. Yeah. And then I've been recently I've gotten into just programming just like a hi-hat on a drum machine. I use the, the Roland um, TR-505 is good for this. And I just use that as the click inside a Pro, so instead of using the Pro Tools click, mm -hmm. I don't know, just something about, it's no. a little bit off, it yep. drifts, and it, but just kind of keeping that as like my visual grid. Oh, so so using a so bar I'll, or I'll, two from the Roland. Well, no, I just, I'll just let the Roland go for like three and oh, a half minutes. so you let the clock, the yeah, drift, so let the, the Roland. And then that's what we'll use as the click. Right. And then when I'm going in to edit, yeah. I just kind of visually edit, you know, if something sounds off, I'll just kind of keep Right, because it won't my, be a grid anymore because no. those drift so crazy. Yeah, and then so I've, a couple of times I've done it where I turn that into the Pro Tools grid, uh -huh. but that always, I don't know. It stiffens it gets, up carry and yeah, stiffens up yeah. and I start to yeah. question myself yeah. <laughs> but yeah that's been that's been like a new thing the last two months which has been fun cool yeah well we got to talk about we, we got to talk about my favorite yeah Eve Tumor I know King Tumor very the man of mystery <laughs> yes exactly I get that and respect that and love that about yeah. him but those records to me are so unique yeah. I mean it feels like what Prince would be doing totally. now, like he's just really used the studio yeah. in the most outrageous ways. But on top of it, there's these amazing songs. Yeah. He's got a killer voice. Yeah. And then there's always these guest vocalists that you have on uh, uh, um, Romanticist and maybe Kerosene, I'm thinking yeah. of. You did those, yeah. right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, those are, uh, yeah. whoever the singers are. So on are Romanticist stunning. was um, Julia Cumming from Sunflower Bean. Oh, and she to me, she's got one of the best rock. I love stuff from Queen, like around. Yeah. So, and I've I've worked on an EP with her for Sunflower Bean, and I've also done another song with them. They're they're awesome. Her voice, she's got like yeah, one of the best voices in rock. So that's her doing like even the high stuff towards. Yeah, the end? yeah. So wow. that, that's her on Romanticist, and then on uh, Kerosene, that's Diana Gordon. Oh, I don't know her. Yeah, and she she's a big uh, writer. So she's written songs with like for Beyonce and a bunch of like R and B and pop stuff, but her voice is just epic. Yeah. So they're both. That's funny that you picked up on that. Cause yeah, that's, the background. That's awesome. Always, I mean, the guest vocals on all yeah. those cuts are always amazing, and they just fit in with his thing so well. Yeah. And I mean, he no. he's hands down my favorite producer. Like whenever I'm in the room with him, it's just the ideas are always amazing and. He comes in with like really clear, again, another one like Clem, where it's just like very clear, you know, has the blueprint, kind of sees where is it, where, even if you don't know as like the other, like where we're headed, I don't know, he just always has like an air of confidence and So calm. he has the vision. He, he, has he sees it and, you know, and even if he doesn't see it, he pretends that he sees it. Mm -hmm. And so he gives us all like this kind of relaxed feeling in the studio where I think it kind of makes you experiment more. Because you don't feel, you don't feel like you're having to like have all the answers at that moment. You know what I mean? Wow, it just, that's just great. feels like I don't know. We're working on this, and uh, that was a cool mistake. Right. Keep it. Don't Whatever touch happens. it. Happens. Yeah, yeah. He yeah. he's very in the freedom. And yeah, that's good. And he he'll just be like, it's done. Don't like like stop. Like move. Step away. It's done. And there's been a couple times where I was like, oh man, I, it, is it? <laughs> is it done? And then you know, a year later, it's out, and you're like, oh yeah, that was perfect that that weird edit 
happened and That's or the guitar right. stopped by I don't think by I've ever heard an artist say it's done <laughs> yeah he he's really good of when he knows when it's cooked even if you think it's not it's like and that, I think that's again kind of goes back to what you're saying with like the mistakes and like the live yes. band. You know what I mean? Like he, because he's more of a, you know, comes from electronic mm -hmm. background, and so that's kind of his way of leaving yeah. that that element of of air and realness. Where it's just like I don't know, no, it's like it's a little bit off, it's a little bit not quantized, it's a little bit out of tune, but leave it. Yeah. You know, Jack White's brilliant like that. And, he really understands so, that. Yeah, getting the humanity and things, getting the quirkiness, getting the personality that makes it stand out. Yeah, and you can tell. Else. I mean, because those records sound loose to me. Oh, I mean, they're brilliant hey. ideas, but but the there's a looseness, there's a chaos in them that that to me, to me that's the hardest thing to do. Yeah, it's the hardest thing to make something feel loose and live and energetic and raw. Especially now. Especially, exactly. But then our favorite records, I'm sure, like his favorite records, like the Stooges and, and all that stuff, MC5. He's like a Stooges fan? No, I'm saying, uh, oh, yeah, oh, yeah, he loves Stooges. Oh, yeah. awesome. It's That's just great. like, all that guy. stuff just feels raw and just, uh, yeah. you know what I mean? But then yeah. adding that uh, the modern element of, like, w you know, where he, all the electronic stuff that he likes and all the uh, witch house and just all these really far out elements of stuff combined with rock, you know? And I feel like a lot of people aren't doing that. Yeah, no and then And then li the live show is like, you know, it's a full, full on like sensory overload rock show, like from start to finish, you know? And it, he's, again, feels like he's the only person in modern music right now who's like putting on like an actual rock show, you know? It's kind of funny that he came from like this ambient electronic world and it's grown into like what it's grown into. Wow. Yeah, it's I know he's really secretive about this process. It's very personal yeah. to him. But can you share any of the mechanics or maybe one specific incident on how you built a track or came out with a sound? Well, a lot, a lot of it's a lot more organic than I think people realize like the, a lot of the drums are real drums I mean 99 percent of it's real drums right. real bass real guitar amazing drummer on that stuff yeah, yeah. I mean, Henry Staff he's just killer. so mechanical but yet there's a groove to yeah. it some of the parts are so I mean they really feel kind of like uh, I don't know maybe fab from the strokes where the parts feel like they were programmed but yet right. they're played right yeah and yeah. that's just a very unique thing most drummers don't really approach yeah that yeah way. the record was a, is a is a lot more organic than people think and we did a lot of it on tape wow yeah, I would have never it, thought yeah, that all of the basic tracking was done on a uh, eight track uh, or no sorry four track um, Ampex 440 so we only used at any one time, we were only using four mics. I mean, we were cheating a little bit. We summed a couple, but it was basically a four mic setup at all times. That's really crazy. Cool. And then you'd bounce everything in the program. We'd go into, yeah. But we were, we were working off of the repro head, so we were right. just going straight in. Right. But then it was only four mics at once. And vocals, everything like that? Yeah, everything like that. Wow. Yeah, the whole, that, that's one of the only records in the last few years that I've worked on where everything hit tape yeah well, it was that's cool that's it was it's, really, a, really it's cool. a lot of work to keep everything in sync too yeah and, yeah and but when you're doing when you're working off the repro head yes you're it's it's fine it's just i think yeah it's just that extra step of like making sure you don't run out of tape and making sure the tape erases right and the machine doesn't fuck up and there's been definitely hours spent like with the machine not Track three is not working anymore. Why? We just lost the kick drum. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So like that is still a big uh, right. nuisance with working with tape, even though you're going into Pro Tools. Instantly. And then you have to fight the sound of tape compression yeah, too. The compression with the drums. Hiss. Yeah. With, yeah. Kick drum. Sometimes you get this kick drum sound that you're madly in love with, yeah. and then you hear it back from tape, and you go, "Oh, what happened?" And I then know. you think, "Okay, I'll just." hit it a little colder yeah. i'll be fine and then it's like not really now it sounds a little wimpy yeah. okay yeah. i gotta push it a little more and and finding that sweet spot with especially with drums yeah and, i agree and even 
bass and guitars. I mean, sometimes guitars, you know, you can they get kind of like them. shrill and yeah, like, it's just, yeah. yeah. But what what we've been doing, what I've been doing is, you know, I'll take Pro Tools and tape, so I always will have both. Uh, and sometimes it's really cool when it's just when it's both of them playing. So I'll use I, I get it lined up sample accurate and sometimes it'll be like the pro tools but isn't, don't you find this drift in it no i chop it oh. so i'll chop I'll, I'll keep nudging the tape right to, to be lined it. up with wow. pro tools that's a lot of work yeah and so then i'll have it basically where i can a i can go between pro tools and tape and it's sample accurate yep. and then i'm able to decide uh, maybe the kick the pro tools kick but the tape overheads that's great. stuff like that that's great and especially for like like with more electronic Stuff that has a bunch of electronic elements in it, you can kind of get away with. Do you ever try putting stuff. Tra two tracks together and getting the little bit of comb filtering oh, yeah. that happens? Oh, yeah, all the time. You um, get guitars. amazing sounds. Yeah. Guitars, yeah, yeah, yeah. especially, yeah. you get amazing yeah. sounds when you have, you know, that, that half a millisecond delay or yeah, whatever it is. Yeah. It just filters out so weird awesome. frequencies. And then, I mean, tape slap, I'm constantly doing that. With the with the machine is just everything like vocals, guitars, drums. Like this, even if I'm doing like the drums completely in Pro Tools, I'll still always have like the analog tape slap going. Um, that's great. But just I don't but know. do you end up with hundreds of tracks? Yeah, <laughs> my sessions are huge. Oh no! Some people won't even mix them. <laughs> <laughs> don't ask me. I have no patience for 120 <laughs> tracks. Uh, 120? <laughs> that's easy. I'm talking like 250. No, that's <laughs> but I, not I've possible. learned. I've learned. I've I've been yelled at enough to, <laughs> to now I submix it. Right. I have to submix and it. And working with. Pro Tools folders is kind of not the best. I don't like, no, I don't yeah. do it. So I have everything's on the screen and it's yeah. all just, the Pro Tools, I, it was funny because this other engineer I was working with, I had him mix prep a, se a couple sessions for me and he didn't tell me, but he put, put it everything all, in folders. And I came back into the studio and I looked at the computer, I was just like, what the fuck is all this? And I, I kind of, getting everything it out of me. the folder. It's, an, it's fucking hard. It's hard. Yeah. I don't get, I, but I stole, don't really understand why it's better. Maybe I'm well. I'm, visually, it's better. It's visually it's better, and then you're able to like process. I still. Uh, someone was saying like you're able to process uh, the entire folder. But you're able to do that anyways if it's going through an aux. Through an aux. If it, but some people like for instance my setup in the back there is an analog summing mixer. Right. Yeah. So I don't really have to go through auxes when I mix. I could if I wanted right. to, but my auxes in a sense are my summing mixer. Your so, auxes are yours. Yeah. Right, right. Because when you're all in the box, that's basically your summing mixer, all your aux right, channels. Right, right. But you're summing out of the box. I'm summing out of the box. Yeah, so, so I, I have one of the, um, I have the, oh, fuck, blanket on what it's called, the the uh, Passive Summer. The, yeah, um, like uh, Rolls? Or the, no, it's not uh, the Rolls. It's, uh, 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 what's the name of that company? Uh, Shit. Uh, Shadow Hills. So I have a Burl. Um, ah, I'm oh, sorry. Anyways, I have a passive summer going into a pair of 1272s. Oh, great. So that's in the 1272s great. to, that's kind of like my, so I'm coming out uh, 16 mm -hmm. channels through the summer into the 1272s. And then from that, I'm going into um, the dangerous D box, uh, the it, yeah, no, the have, silver one, the, the the EQ, the stereo EQ. I forget what it's called. Oh, the the Bax one. The Bax. Oh, yeah, Bax. those are beautiful. Yeah, the Bax EQ. Yeah, and then into the the uh, SSL, the C1, the Allen Spark. Oh, good. Yeah, that's kind of like is that what you have? Yeah, yeah, that's cool. my mix yeah. chain. But yeah. even doing that, like even going out through the analog, some, like you instantly gets bigger, it gets wider, it gets deeper. Yeah, I know. It opens up. The yeah. mix. I I, I kind of. I got addicted to it, and I now and 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 I don't really. Mi I mix like half of what I do, uh -huh. and so, but I've gotten addicted to it to the point where even in my productions, I'm, con I'm always routed out. Yeah. And so then I've kind of boxed myself into taking on more work, meaning that I end up having to mix stuff that because I don't want to mix. In, in your sort of proprietary Because it's routed style. through, yeah. yeah, and it sounds a certain way, and then when I go back through, every, bring everything back through one and two, the production, the, like, yeah, it kind of 
fucks it, you. Sometimes. It always feels so much smaller, so much more congested, so scratchy and uptight on the top yeah, end. Yeah, it's really weird. Yeah, just breaking it out uh, is. Yeah. It's so like much more friendly on the ears. Are you only on doing body. 16 or do you? No, I'm doing 32. I have a 32 That's bus awesome. summing mixer. That's awesome. So, yeah, so I'm breaking Which one are you everything using? out. Uh, I have a Burl one. The Burl one. And then I, I change my stereo bus chain depending on the music. Um, I almost always use my Curve Bender EQ. Yep. Sometimes it's the Shadow Hills compressor. Right. Sometimes the Allen Smart. Right. Sometimes the SSL. I have one of those Fusions. And oh, wow. I, I just tried their new um, Mix Bus Plus, they call it, compressor, which is really, really good. You can do a lot of really interesting things with it. A um, lot, a lot of different sounds to be gained from that compressor it's oh, quite wow. unique check that out. so you know like sort of for pop stuff i'll treat it maybe more with the ssl stuff right. but rock stuff i might use the shadow hills more right. or because right. they all have different colors so i really kind of pick and choose but the burl has the makeup gain the burl it? has the makeup gain right. yeah yeah i right. mean usually i'm pushing it too hard right, right. I, I never have to yeah i have too the much. i have the bomber like that's how yeah, i that's, that's how my, i capture it that's me too so right. when i go through the mix chain, how I bring it back into Pro Tools is through the bomber, and I like pushing it. Yeah, yeah. It's no, cool. Yeah, me too. I, that's my last stop yeah. is the Burl Bomber yeah, as well. Yeah, yeah. So, there, yeah. That, I mean, I wish I could have, I wish my interfaces could be the mothership, or is that what it's called? Yeah. yeah. It sounds pretty amazing. It's so sweet Fuck. sounding, so thick, and you loving analog tape, yeah. you would definitely it just sounds love awesome. it because it has a much like more I've done a couple things sound. over at um, East West in uh -huh. Studio Two, I think that where they have all the burls yes or all the convert yeah Whew. i know yeah. <laughs> it's like so much bigger one of my favorite records that you worked on was wise tribes icky thump ah. like that that was great jack great white meg the groove between the both of them is incredible fucking iconic yep like literally one of the most iconic grooves the Talk last about putting two people in the room together you know, the chemistry between them, the way they understand tempo and dynamics uh, together, no one else could do that. Jack, with any other drummer, it's a whole different thing. There will never be another White Stripes without Meg. Right. It, it's her simplicity, her understanding of when she needs to slow down and speed up and follow his guitar playing, it's uncanny. I mean, wow. obviously, you know, the, the, the joke, the rumor was that they were brother and sister. Right, right. And you know how brothers and sisters are. Yeah. They really understand each other in a lot yeah. of ways. They truly do have that kind of connection. Wow. And it's, it's pretty incredible. How did they, it's, like... How did they show you songs in the studio? They just like they play them, or was there demos, or did you the, know what you the, were getting the, into yeah. before? The, the 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 demos for the record were Jack set up a boombox um, in his living room when he and Meg were recording. But you know, Jack is not really a technical guy. Set up, oh wow! He's really I mean, you got, they recorded the demos on like on the just, microphone of the boombox, the internal microphone. So wow. these demos were so overloaded, so distorted <laughs> that that Jack would go here, check this one out, and I was kind of like. God, sounds like the last one, Jack, because <laughs> it was like uh, two hundred percent distortion. You couldn't you, you couldn't hear anything. Whoa. But uh, I will. I, I remember he played me a snippet of the Icky Thump guitar riff, uh -huh. and I was like, "Whoa, yeah, that's something." But it's still same thing. The recording was so blown out, I couldn't tell anything. But so, like the, on, on that song in particular, it almost sounds like a distorted organ or like a what's like that main sound the keyboard that he yeah. plays really what fast it, what, and proggy what was that because that sound is like literally one of the most iconic sounds of the last 20 years for sure it's it's a 1959 univox synthesizer hmm. that 
the Beatles actually had one and used one. Mm. And Jack found it in a music store in Auckland, New Zealand. Oh, wow. It looks like an accordion. It comes in this case where the speaker and the keyboard separate and the keyboard is connected via a cloth hose you oh, know how wow. back in the right. 40s i guess yeah, yeah, yeah. 50s they would wrap the wire on a piece of cloth yeah. um so it, it's a small keyboard but the crazy thing about it is that it was pretty out of tune right so the reason that he's playing so fast on that keyboard part throughout the tune is that if he landed on any note for a long time you'd hear how out of tune it was oh, wow. so he was smart enough to realize if i played really fast and dance around the keyboard it's you know it's in key yeah. but you don't hear how out of tune it is so because the notes so short. how did they how did you guys go about tracking it did he play that he, with the drum like no was it that, the drums, was, that was maybe one of the few things on that particular song that were overdubbed. The drums and guitars always went down live. And then did he sing live? And then he, he, on some songs, he would sing live, but for the most part, all the vocals were overdubbed. There's a double track vocal on that, uh, and the vocals were deliberately recorded differently because right. a left and right double. Right. Um, one was with a Tube 47, and the other, I think, might have been with an SM7. I can't remember, but I, I treated them differently, so they're uh, kind of oh, wow. moving a lot and oh, sort of cool. talking to each other. But a song like Icky Thump, it's quite long, right? And so they would, it was just the two of them in the room, guitar and drums, just looking at each other, and he's just kind of just going off the top there. of his head, directing and told. And then was there any edits made on oh, the yeah. perform? Oh, okay. It was done 16 track analog, tons of edits on so the, all the songs. Right. Okay. I'll, I'll tell you the funny story about the song Icky Thump the day that we went to cut it we had just finished doing this song that was super chill kind of folky yeah. really simple drum sound um, really small sounds delicate and then he said I think I feel like doing Icky Thump now and I, I couldn't quite remember exactly which one that was anyways he and Meg went out in the room and starting started tracking it and my sounds were so inappropriate for the tune because the minute I heard that riff I was like this has to be big this is right. a this is a hit record the minute I heard that yeah. riff I knew yeah. it was a hit there was yeah. no question about it yeah. and I knew the sounds had to be big and rocking and over the top but my sounds because we had just done this folk song were pretty simple and innocent and right. warm right. and I was scrambling patching things in and compressing things and trying to get to a place where it felt appropriate for the song and that day for whatever reason Meg and Jack just weren't connecting and maybe they spent about an hour working on the tune and Jack finally said I don't know I just don't feel it today and so thankfully they scrapped it that day so the next time we came back to the tune I knew what I had to yeah, do I kind of prepared. knew what the sounds needed to be for that right. song oh, wow. and because that was all analog, no Pro Tools whatsoever right, yeah. in that record, yeah. I had to get all my sounds on the tracking date. So all the processing was done while I tracked. Everything that was added to those drums, compression, distortion, etc., was all done. So on how the many tracks days. of drums? I think the drums were four tracks. Um, and then do you have parallels um, printed? So I had parallels that I actually would blend in while we were tracking. Right. I also had one of those DBX subharmonic yeah. synthesizers yeah, I that, that I, I added that. to the kick drum. Yeah. And again, while we're tracking, yeah. um, I might have been doing some overload of distortion on the snare drum. Um, and again, all blended into those four tracks some songs were i think just four tracks of drums some songs were four tracks plus a stereo room mic right. um and then what uh, stereo room mic would you use? you know it was a combination of mics um probably 87s uh maybe an aea ribbon mic uh we used a lot of coals could have been another coals uh, yeah i think there was a coals behind the drum kit that was really a lot of the sound that studio d at blackbird is one of my right. favorite sounding okay. rooms on the planet what tape machine 16 track uh those were 
uh, Studer A800 right. tape machines which sound yeah. really fat. Yeah. Um, and, you know, track-wise, it would be a stereo guitar. Jack always used a Fender Twin, which was the loudest thing in the world. He would put it on two, and you could. we had right. to get... Uh, shotgun earphone yeah. you know, ear, yeah. ear protectors yeah. to go into the ISO booth with the guitars because they were just devastatingly wow. loud. Um, and I think in the process, we ended up blowing out something like six Coles ribbon right. microphones because we had those on the oh, guitar. Oh, you, oh wow. And um, I, we blew the ribbons yeah. all the time. We yeah. switched to AEA microphones, the AEA 84. Fours yeah, maybe, yeah. Um, those didn't blow up as much. Uh, there'd be fifty sevens, uh, sometimes Royers, but yeah. but we started with the coals and went through them like we were sending wow. them back to be re-ribboned every oh, other wow. day. It was pretty crazy. So it was a twin, and what was the other amp? A silver tone, the big silver tone, the fourteen eighty five or eighty six, uh -huh. which is basically the bass amp. Right. So kind of that's how he got his sort of clean lower tones and the real. And were, the roar. was his pedals like you, they weren't split? It was a unison uh, to both. No, it was or? just a um, th whatever pedals were in the chain, and th his pedal chain was really simple. Um, you know, he used his Digitech Whammy. Right. Um, he used an MXR uh, line driver, the white box, yeah. um, and. Um, that might have been it, you know, wow. very, very little. I mean, right, really yeah. about the, but yeah. with Jack, sorry, um, with Jack, it's really about his hands and yeah. his technique. Yeah, yeah. He's so good and he's got such a ferocious uh, attack to the way he plays yeah. that yeah. It, it's it's really, really, really unique. Yeah, so awesome. I, I think on that song, we would have had a stereo guitar track is the main guitar and then there might have been one other track that doubled the part and then there's the solo and uh whatever backgrounds or tambourines and uh you know since we were doing automated on console mixes it really meant that you only had 15 tracks right. because you had to keep a track for simpty right. for the fader control yeah. so i mean and the what, was he, what was he singing through I'm sorry, say What uh, vocal mic was he using? Uh, yeah, vocal mics, I changed up a lot from song to song. Right. The interesting thing is we <clears throat> kept chasing this little Richard vocal sound that right. Jack had in his mind. He loved that overdriven, blown up, yeah. uh, little Richard kind of tone. And I tried overloading V76s and every possible preamp. A 44, yeah, 74. 44s, RCA 77s, okay. all that stuff. Um, and I ended up usually with a 1073 model and I would overdrive the preamp. So that's how I got the distortion. There's a particular blue face 1176 that they had at blackbird that just sounded perfect for his vocals right, yeah. it's like a lot of the i would say maybe you know 50 percent of the distortions coming from the 1073 then another 20 percent from that blue face um the interesting thing is that for jack i could never get enough distortion for him you know he always wanted more and more he wanted character and so i came up with this crazy concept because he wanted to hear it in the headphones and there was no plugins right um so i came up with this crazy thing where i would have him sing into an rca 77 and i put a guitar amp on the floor right in front of him and a guitar amp that had a separate preamp and master volume. So I could actually take a 57, put it right next to the RCA, feed the 57 into the guitar amp, overload the guitar amp, really distort the guitar amp, then just turn up the master a little bit so that distorted vocal would feed into the back of the ribbon oh, mic. That's a great idea. So oh, wow. we, we actually had a microphone that in a sense was very much the sound of it changed 
to his performance. In other words, right. when he got in closer, it got fatter and warm. Yeah. When he pulled yeah. back, it was thin. He got less distortion. When he moved in and screamed, there was more distortion and it came into the back of the microphone. That's really so he cool. had this thing. And that it's, still, it's only one track. And it's only one yeah, track. Yeah, that's great. Absolute, so I actually would blend yeah. the 57 that I mic'd the guitar amp yeah. in. I would blend that with the RCA yeah. and get a combination that yeah. worked right and I could easily find a balance and it was wonderful for him because he felt really inspired by wow, it. He had this, cool. this tool that gave him instant feedback because yeah, yeah. you know when you just overload a preamp yeah. sometimes you just get one level of distortion and it's not dynamic. Yeah. You know? yeah. So this gave him something that kind of moved and wow, he, he really could cool. really just play with it. So that's it was, really cool. It, it was it was pretty fun for him. That's awesome. But and but the you magic. Did there, you mix it? Yes. So you we mixed mix it, it. Um, and we cut the tracks in Studio D of Blackbird, and we mixed it in Studio A of Blackbird, which is the uh, eighty seventy eight console. And you guys do it all in one stretch, or did you take a break and we come took back a to little mix? break before mixing but the record was done relatively quickly uh -huh. i know that all the mixing was done in five days oh, so wow. i think we mixed like 12 songs or whatever it was in in you know, two songs a day wow. always right, and right. you know it's 16 track analog and all my sounds were on tape so really the mixing process was not that involved it was really just balances right. um, the great thing at Blackbird is they have all this original Abbey Road yeah. TG yeah. modules yeah. it's incredible <laughs> sounding yeah. so we used on the stereo bus oh, wow. we used these Abbey Road EQs and compressors that had such a unique sound. Wow, that's so, awesome. you know, I mean, part of the sound of those records is the great sounding room of Blackbird. And then you just mix down to an ATR. We mix down to an ATR um, one inch two track, I believe we mixed that oh, too, wow. which is really fat sounding. Oh, wow, that's At awesome. 30 ips, it kind of keeps the transients yeah. there. Uh, but, you know, the one low inch end. two track. Yeah, that's awesome. the low end is much more yeah. digital sounding. Yeah, yeah, it doesn't yeah. sound so squished and yeah. tight. And, you know, so, so that was great. Um, yeah, in fact, we had done. Um, a cut or two previous to the White Stripes where Blackbird had this two inch eight track machine. So basically, you know, every track is that wide. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So it was big sounding. Yeah, that's awesome. Really, really great. Two inch eight track. Yeah. All the way. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I wish there were more of those. Totally. They're really cool. Right but, on, man. That's yeah. awesome. I just saw him play a couple of weeks ago at Glastonbury. <sighs> He's shredding. Yeah. I mean, it's just like jaw dropping. He's such a great player. It's jaw dropping. Such a great player. Yeah. And he makes it look so easy the way he plays. And uh, it's yeah. crazy. No, I, I, I crazy. really treasure my time with him. He's yeah. really a, a special artist. And, and I think the thing that makes him unique is his. He's really aware of the audience and what they want to hear and I think he really like I mean he makes music for himself like we all do make what we want to hear yeah. but I think he really wants to keep that connection to yeah. the fans there yeah. so he's really really aware of sort of preserving the energy and the character and anything that he thinks people will really get off on yeah. and be excited by he protects that with his life yeah. i mean it's he's not precious about anything other than making sure it feels great yeah i mean i just love how he was able to take blues music and make it feel hip and current and like adventurous again right but at the same time keeping true to like the blues aesthetic of it's all analog it's all it's like very old school yep. right but he figured out a way to make it feel super modern and fresh and hip and you're just like fuck it felt futuristic you know what I mean? very much without being at all and his records now that he makes the solo records are super futuristic yeah, yeah. you know he's really like you know I, I love the fact that he's working with like run the jewels I know, like this so perfect cool. combination yeah. and and the the hip-hop element that he Always, there's always, always like a little bit of an underlying hip hop element to yep. everything he did, yep. and I felt like that 
in the groove and et cetera, like just always the vocal groove, like it always just made the stuff feel exciting. Where when you listen to other contemporary blues music, you're just like, yikes. <laughs> it's just not as adventurous. Yep. You know, the plane's insane. No, he's but like how they captured it is very basic and yep. normal. Where he kept it, I don't know, he was able to turn on a whole generation of kids. Eve, can't thank you enough for being here. Thank you. Th these are great stories, great right on. insights. I'm such a fan. This was such I'm a I'm a fan. Oh, I'm oh. honored to even like to be oh, yeah, man, no, this is you. great. It's and great to, to share a wall with around you. The, exactly. <laughs> <laughs>